Well, from that security-related uh, situation, uh, we'll be bringing you more on that. But we have the graphic business Stambik Bank breakfast meeting. It's taking place at the Mivimpik Ambassador Hotel. The theme is tackling unemployment to create wealth opportunities for Ghana. We go live now on the ground with our crew at there as we find out what is happening. Daryl Kwao is standing by. Daryl, good morning to you. Great to have you join uh, on air on Joy News. My name is Daryl Kwao. And this edition, we are tackling the teething problem of unemployment here in this country. And so uh, the theme for uh, this morning's uh, discussion is tackling unemployment to create wealth. We expect uh, President of the Private Enterprises Federation, Nano Sebonsu here, also Florence Hope Wudu, who is Managing Consultant, uh, Purple Almond Consulting Services, and Dr. Edu Susakodia, an economist, uh, lecturer with the University of Ghana, uh, to tackle this uh, problem that we have faced over the years. And I just want to read um, some statistics from the Ghana Statistical Service as uh, published by Graphic Business Online, which shows that the, the rate of people who are available for work but unable to find jobs doubled to 13.4% in 2021, and that's from 5.3% recorded in 2010. And the 2021 figure, which was announced in the general report, on the 2021 population housing census is now the highest since 1984, the highest since 1984, when the country's unemployment data was first reported. So it tells you the sort of uh, uh, crisis we are in when it comes to uh, jobs in the country. And to discuss this further, as we look ahead to the discussion this morning, is Charles Daniel Kodiopoku, who is a senior lecturer and economist, a deputy quality assurance director at Methodist University, so, uh, Eric Amponsa, Boateng, tax consultant and an economist, uh, I'm happy to have you on board to discuss this uh, issue with unemployment in the country. So I want to start with you. You had me read uh, the stats there, uh, Mr. Boateng. We are in a very critical situation when it comes to uh, unemployment in the country. You agree? Yes. And um, good morning to your listeners and viewers. I think that we are... And um, right, rightly so, because if you look at the topic or, or the theme for the event this morning, we want to be able to tackle unemployment. And I think that before we can do that as a nation, we must know the causes. Once we're able to identify the causes, then of course we can look at... So what are the causes then? Yes, um, if you look at unemployment, they are basically three or four, four types of unemployment. Okay, we have the, the structural, we have the, the cyclical, we have the seasonal, and probably we can also talk about the, the frictional. And so once you're able to identify each one of them, then we'll be able to deal with them and ensure that we're able to reduce them or reduce unemployment. And once we do that, then we're able to generate or create the wealth that we need for economic growth and development. Well, speak about uh, creating the wealth for economic growth and development. Uh, tell us, uh, Mr. Poku, what sort of uh, economic burden it is for us that we have so many people who do not have jobs in the country? All right. Thank you very much. This is a problem that probably we have created ourselves. We, as a nation, we continue to create it. And until we come to terms with it, like my brother said, we'll be adding more and more. How have we created the unemployment Thank situation? You. We have changed our educational system in such a way that when somebody has gone to school, even at SS, he or she thinks that there are certain jobs he should not do. Get to America, get to UK, and you find somebody who is a tractor operator, but he has a degree. Come to Ghana, let someone who has a degree go and say, I'm going to drive a tractor. Listen to what people will say. So because of that, we have a certain mentality that certain jobs are meant for certain people. Mm -hmm. And so this unemployment rate we are talking about, 13 point something percent, it is possible it is even more than that. It is higher than that. 
The reason is that there are people who have specific jobs in mind. And therefore, if they don't get those jobs, they are not prepared to take any other job. Technically, those people should not be counted as unemployed. When you are talking of unemployment, mm -hmm. you have decided that you don't want to work. God, there is work. Why do you want to say, I want to operate only lighting system in, the, in, in Ghana? when you could have done something else. Well, they can't be blamed if there's, the system is structured to make them want to work. For instance, they say uh, uh, work in an office rather than maybe do something that is technical or vocational. That is why I said we have created it. Mm -hmm. The mindset, we should fine tune mindset. How come that a student will go and do something like catering in school? Then you finish and you apply for a job at the bank. Is something wrong with you? <laughs> Catering is, is a skill you have developed. And therefore, you have to go and create an avenue to even employ other people. And you want to go and sit at the bank and do what? Do we cook at the bank? But because this person knows somebody, that person will be picked ahead of somebody who did banking course, who did accounting course, who probably did economics. Because he doesn't know anybody. Even so, those people are struggling to find jobs. Yes, I know. But there are people who are crisscrossing all over the place. But when you look at what they have, they shouldn't have gone there in the first place. That is why I started by saying that we have created a problem. And if we don't solve it, we will even create more problems. And I guess we all got the wake-up call when the finance minister said some time ago that the, there are no jobs uh, in the public sector anymore. Uh, which uh, sort of revived our uh, you know, interest in entrepreneurship. If you read the data from the Ghana Studies Court Service, we are told that most of the unemployed are between the ages of 15 and 24. And so now the government has started this You Start initiative to get young people to think entrepreneurial. Uh, to what extent would this help, uh, uh, Mr. Watting, in tackling the, the situation of joblessness? Okay. Uh, well, I will say that we must look at the, the policies that we have as, as a nation. Like he mentioned, what kind of education do we need? What kind of training do we need? Yes, I was happy a few years ago when the government decided to upgrade the polytechnics into uh, technical universities. Mm -hmm. But let's ask ourselves, if we, we have a technical university, my understanding is that that university will produce graduates in carpentry, masonry, and all that. But we find most of these universities pursuing courses like banking, finance. Okay, so like he said, we are even making it worse because the policies that we have, our educational structure, at the end of the day, what type of graduates are we churning out? Look, there are certain jobs, but I can tell you, people do not have the requisite qualifications to take up those jobs. And so, if the kind of education or the educational policies that we have, at the end of the day, they are even going to make the unemployment situation worse, then where are we going? as a nation. Look, um, government also takes or makes certain uh, decisions. And immediately that decision is made, immediately there is um, unemployment. I'll give just one example. OK. Oh, can, I, can I go ahead? We just have three minutes. So I'm going three to give minutes. you one okay. minute so that um, okay. Mr. Opoku will have the other okay. two so, minutes. So for example, you agree with me that the moment government said they were going to implement e-levy, the Momo operators, I'm telling you, about 60 to 70 percent lost their job because prior to 1st of January, people went and withdrew all their monies. And so those who were even doing those small, small Momo transactions, they all lost their jobs. Okay, we look at farmers. Okay. Farmers, okay. In Ghana, because we don't have irrigational schemes, farming only takes place within a certain uh, part of the year because it's not at all year round because they don't even have the water. And yet we spend money on, excuse me, needless things. And so I think that 
if you are going to deal with unemployment, it lies on the government. And I've said that government cannot employ everybody. But government must make sure that there is an enabling environment for individuals, for businesses to thrive. Because it's only when that happens that we can expand and even employ more people. And don't forget, at the end of the day, when we employ more people, okay. we are going to benefit from the taxes that the employees pay. So probably we, 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 we can look at that. Some other time. Uh, Mr. Puku, we recognize that uh, government alone can't do this, if, even though it, it holds uh, a lot of the responsibility as well. Uh, how else can we fix the unemployment situation aside from government and its policies? The private sector is the way forward. That is the truth. But we have to fine tune the Ghanaian's mind. That's why I've given you an example that you don't necessarily need to go and sit in the office because you have completed a university. Look, go to the farm. There is a whole value chain businesses lying there and nobody is thinking about that. Okay, okay, we've got to go. Um, I, I just have to point out that there are lots of people who are starting to think uh, like entrepreneurs who want to do stuff, but then now they are complaining about the cost of doing business and whether or not the business environment is favorable. So we are going to go to the hall in a bit uh, to start this conversation on uh, the unemployment situation and how we can we should fix that so we can create wealth uh, for our economy. My name is Daryl Kwa. Thanks very much, uh, Charles Daniel Kujiopoku, who is Senior Lecturer, Economist, uh, Deputy Quality Assurance Director at the Methodist University, Eric Amponsa Boateng, Tax Econ uh, Consultant and Economist. I'm going to hand it over to you. You, uh, Winston Anwa, as we kickstart the second quarter edition of the Graphic Business Tambic Bank breakfast meeting. Newspaper company owned by a British national would frustrate their fight for independence from Britain. Graphic Communications Group Limited, or GCGL, was established as a private business in 1950 by the Daily Mirror Group of Britain. At that time, Tin is tackling the unemployment situation in the country. How do we fix it to create wealth? Uh, you know that we are not in normal times. As I pointed out, we've seen the numbers uh, double over a decade from 5.3%. We are doing over 13%, and the situation. Uh, it's going to get dire uh, in the coming years if we do not fix it. And so it's an important conversation to ha have. And as you heard uh, Charles Opoku say, we have to start by tuning our minds because most people think that uh, they have to work in an office after school when there are opportunities um, elsewhere to work. Uh, we heard our panelists talk about the educational system and how we need to, you know, sort of Re, uh, transform it or you know restructure it so that we, we are giving people opportunities to do um, stuff in different sectors of the economy that uh, we can find the jobs. Uh, we've talked about government policies and how government can also help in that regard. Uh, we know that the government has started the You Start initiative, which is supposed to get young people to think like entrepreneurs to start something. The finance minister, Ken Ofreata, already indicating that the public sector jobs are uh, choked. I mean, you wouldn't get opportunity anywhere. And so it, it is a wake up call for young people who want to start jobs. Right? Even as we talk about that, you also have to think about whether we have the enabling environment for these young people to be able to even start their businesses. And, you know, when they're able to do that, they create jobs for other people. And so it is a conversation to have this morning. So I'm told we can connect to uh, the hall right now where Winston Amma is getting ready to kickstart the second quarter edition of the Graphic Business Stambeck Bank Breakfast Meeting. All right, a very good morning to all of you, and thanks to all of you for making time to be here for the quarter two edition of the Graphic Business Stambic Bank Breakfast Meeting, themed tackling unemployment to create wealth opportunities for Ghana. Now, with Ghana's current unemployed rate standing at 13.4%, with almost half a million being first-time job seekers, it's very important we have this conversation, a conversation about tackling unemployment. In the 2022 budget, we saw the ambitious plan of government to create one million jobs in three years, dubbed You Start. Some 10 billion Ghana sees, 
according to government, will be spent over the period in ensuring that we are able to tackle unemployment in Ghana. This will not be the first time we have tried or attempted to tackle unemployment in Ghana. Of course, we have had the National Youth Employment Program, which became the Ghana Youth Employment and Entrepreneurial Development Agency. We have the Youth Employment Agency. In the past, we've had less debt. We have had yes debt. The question is, why are we still faced with unemployment in this country? And that's why today it's important that we are all gathered here to deliberate, discuss, and find solutions to it, but most importantly, look at the opportunities for Ghana when it comes to tackling unemployment to create wealth. My name is Winston Amoy, and I'll be in charge of this ceremony. We'll invite Rachel Addy to give us the opening prayer. Shall we please pray? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we are so much grateful unto you. We thank you for this gathering. Spirit of the living God, we invite your presence here. We pray for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and divine protection. We pray, O oh God, that as we discuss this unemployment issues of our nation, we pray, O oh God, may this discussion bring growth in our lives, in our businesses, and in our nation. We declare the meeting open in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Right, so let's continue. And let me just say that we have, as you get seated, we have feedback sheets on your table. So in the course of the program, uh, you could kindly fill the feedback sheets and so we can pick it after the end of the program. We now have the welcome address by the editor of Graphic Communications Group, Kobe Asma. Is he here, Kobe? Okay, if uh, Kobe is not here, then I think uh, the Lord would fall on Charles Benoni Okine to give us the welcome address. Let's welcome him with a round of applause. Hi, Timothys. Mr. Chairman, my MD and board chair, CEO of Stambeck, distinguished panelists and speakers, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. Please allow me to welcome you with a small story. As an urgent lecturer some time back before I retired, don't ask me my age, a couple of years back, any time I stood before my students, I asked them, so where are you guys going after school? This question often shocked them, but my reason was simple. Everywhere seemed choked. There are no jobs in their chosen fields, and I gravely worry about our young, energetic guys and I worry about our ladies, so young, fresh, yet vulnerable. Last year, the Ghana Statistical Service released its 2021 Housing and Population Census report. Part of the report revealed that the unemployment rate in the country stands at about 13.4%. That was triple the rate compared to last decade. In a chat with some of the some statisticians, they claimed that the actual rate is rather three times higher than what was reported. But it was based on an ILO methodology. That's why we have our 13.4%. This is not to say that the GSS report is wrong. But we leave that discussion for another day. Mr. Chairman, the bottom line is that the unemployment canker is real and hurting. It is getting worse by the day, and something needs to be done about it. It is against this background that we, at Graphic Business, the business agenda setters, in collaboration with our partners, Stambic Bank, deemed it fit to brainstorm to help shape government policy in this direction. Mr. Chairman, 
Today, our theme is tackling unemployment to create wealth, opportunities for Ghana. To help do justice to this theme, we have assembled some of the finest brains to deal with the theme, broken down into three perspectives. First, we look at the causes and sources of unemployment. This will be handled by Dr. Edu Uusu Saakodie, an economics lecturer, University of Ghana. The second is existing and new opportunities, which will be done by Ms. Florence Hope Hudu, managing consultant, Purple Almond Consulting Services. And the third is avenues for jobs creation, avenue, avenues, avenues for jobs and wealth creation to be tackled by our own good friend and a very good friend of the media, uh, Nana Osebunsu, is the president of Private Enterprises Federation. Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the management and staff at Graphic, my powerful team at Graphic Business, let me mention some of their names, Ama, Maxwell, Bruce, McLean, Kester, and uh, Nyedu, I welcome you all to this August function. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable only unto God. Please enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Charles Benoni Okain, editor of The Graphic Business, and my very good friend. Yes, you've made a very important point, the point about 13.4 and whether it really captures Ghana's situation. Of course, the ILO says if in the last seven days you have worked, you're considered employed. And so if anybody worked over the period, got paid for it, that person would be considered employed. But the question is, after the census, what happens to those people? The Ghana Statistical Service has told us that they'll be conducting quarterly surveys to be able to know the rate of unemployment in this country. But that's something that hasn't started yet. Thank you once again for welcoming all of us. Would now invite the Chief Executive of Standard Bank, Kwame Nasumini, to give us his opening remarks. And let's welcome him with a round of applause. Mr. Chair, the team from Graphic Corporation, our partners from Multimedia, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you very warmly to this uh, latest edition of the Stambic Graphic uh, Business Series. Um, a big thank you to the Graphic Corporation for always bringing pressing topics to the fore and for partnering with Stambic to gather some intuitive minds to discuss issues facing the Ghanaian community. And this morning, that issue is unemployment. We should first acknowledge the issue of integrity around the data, and I believe my, uh, my friend Charles highlighted that. Whilst there appears to be some inconsistency on the figures, one thing is not up for debate the fact that unemployment is a problem. We can all agree on its significant socio-economic impact on our community. We can collaborate our thinking on how this issue can be mitigated in our own spheres of influence. And that is why we're here this morning. At Stambic Bank, our brand promise centers around finding new ways to make dreams possible the dreams of parents wanting to offer their children the best education, the dreams of graduates wanting to enter the workforce and put their newly acquired skills to good use, and equally, the dreams of the budden graphic designer, retailer, or technician to cat catalyze their business aspirations. In the absence of having an offer of employment from an established institution, we should expect to support those who are willing and able to create their own marketplace and employment opportunities. We as a society are often at a risk of associating unemployment with the youth. And yes, it is a problem which our young adult citizens contend with 
all too often. However, unemployment doesn't necessarily know a specific age. We see older adults in our community who either haven't been able to acquire the right skills and training to apply to a vocation, or those who have struggled to match their existing skill set to the opportunities available in the job market. Where those working age adults are concerned, we at Stambik are superbly positioned to support entrepreneurs with fueling their dreams which lead to individual business development and Ghana's overall economic growth. After all, a significant part of our business caters towards the needs of small and medium-sized enterprises. Our clients benefit directly, not just from us offering suitable financial products to support their businesses, but also from us taking a genuine interest in enabling their work through skills support. Those who do not yet have the privilege of serving as our clients similarly benefit from our CSI initiatives, our corporate social investment initiatives, which have entrepreneurship as a key pillar. Mr. Chairman, our Stambic Bank incubator was birthed for this precise reason. In 2020, the bank hosted 47 capacity building sessions that impact a total of 249, I'm sorry, 2,498 participants. We also hosted 52 coaching and mentoring sessions. In total, 380 small to medium sized enterprises and startups directly benefited from these training programs. It would be remiss of us not to acknowledge the role that digitization plays in the evolution of the jobs market. As a world, we are consuming more products and services than ever before, which have digital and electronic components. As a result, the opportunities for formal and self-employment are becoming increasingly skewed towards individuals who possess the skills which contribute to digital economies and ecosystems. We can glean inspiration from nations which have built entire employment sectors centered around digitization. These are countries such as Kenya, Egypt, South Africa, and Rwanda. Increasingly, we must, keep, we must all keep our nose, noses pressed against the window of digitization. Job market entrants need digital skills to get a foot in the door. Employees across all sectors, without exception, need to leverage on their digital capabilities in order to thrive in the workplace. Businesses need to embrace digital ways of working to keep up with the competition. And overall, our society expands and prospers at an accelerated pace as a result. This is why at Stambic we have placed STEM education at the core of our CSI endeavors. We are preoccupied with contributing towards the success of those wishing to study STEM subjects and work in STEM spaces. We believe that with a little help from us, if we can, the power to effect change and inspire prosperity is closer than we would dare to dream. Solving the unemployment problem might take its roots in ask, asking and answering a series of questions. How does our domestic education system serve us and our youth in preparing for either structured employment or entrepreneurship? How might we, in our own sectors and spheres of influence, make a dent in the country's unemployment figures? Hopefully, Today's discussion will open up some sharing of perspectives and solutions and will equally shift the needle in answering some of these crucial questions. We are looking forward to a very engaging discussion where we can share ideas and perspectives on the matter of unemployment. Thank you very much.
Thank you very, very much, uh, Kwame Nasmini, who's Chief Executive of Stanbeck Bank. And you talk about a very important thing. You've talked about our education, you've talked about skills development. And so you would ask the question, over the period, I mean, uh, since the establishment of the Ghana Youth Employment and Entrepreneurial Development Agency, one of the things we have talked about consistently is the development of skills. Even with NAPCO, we talked about the development of skills because we had an exit strategy, so-called. Uh, we all know what has happened now, and that's why it's important today we look at how we can tackle this once and for all. Let me say that we are live on the Joy News channel, and we're also live on Joy 99.7 FM. We'll continue with the program, and as we continue with the program, we've had opening remarks from the CEO of Stambeck Bank. This is Graphic Business Stambeck Bank breakfast meeting. So we'd now invite the board chair of Graphic Communications Group, Professor Olivia Kwapong, to give us her opening remarks. Thank you very much. Is it good? I must make it clear for the records that I do this on behalf of my MD, who is attending to some critical business on behalf of our great brand, Graphic Communications Group Limited. Mr. George Ousu and Sam, the chairperson, who will be introduced very soon to moderate the session and guide the process for us. CEO of Standing Bank, Mr. Kwamina Esmeni, who has given us that um, insightful presentation. Distinguished panel members who would give us great thoughts and ideas to take away. Distinguished personalities, my own graphic group of company, the people who drive um, this project. And then the various distinguished media people helping us, the almighty joy. Multimedia group, right? Uh-huh. We thank you very much for this partnership and all distinguished personalities who have made this program and this brand a success. It's very insightful to be here once again to discuss a very passionate theme, which is about youth unemployment. Unemployment, and I like the way uh, Mr. Smeni mentioned that it's not an issue of the youth. And it's really so, it's about all of us, including with the professors. We need to create opportunities to create wealth in all corners and how we can spread the resources and make sure that people that we engage and encounter with in any corner of our country benefit from the world that we all create. And therefore, I am happy to be part of this um, this discussion, the discourse that we're going to have. And as I was listening also to Mr. Smenin, I mean, I also make my note for myself as a professor of the University of Ghana. Sometimes people will say that we, the teachers, are the people who create the unemployment. And therefore, people in the industry would look forward to the opportunity for us to collaborate with you, be very practical in our approach, such that when our students graduate, even before they leave our walls, they are able to, they have already set up their own businesses and creating wealth already. It is unfortunate that it's in our part of the world that when we put our kids in school, we feel that all that they should do is to study, 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 study. But interestingly, the advanced communities right from high school, you are working and you are studying. You drop your kid in school, you pick them from school, and then you go to the next, you go to Walmart, and the person checking you out is a secondary school student. And our students go to school abroad and work and study, I mean, on campus work, off campus work, our opportunities that they have all around them. But unfortunately, you don't find our students working in our libraries. You don't find them making photocopies for us. You go to the restaurant and you don't find our students serving us. And it's like the illiterate mom in the village should bring the momo for the, uh, everything that the student need for the data and all of that when there is opportunities all around us. 
How do we send our students to the Medina market to learn how the market women are packaging contemporary so that the person will study and say that when I finish school, I see that there's so much demand for contemporary and I will produce contemporary and I will package it so well and I will put it in a nice environment and I will even go to the offices and sell fresh contemporary to create wealth out of that. And I feel that if we mean the business, this is how practical we must become. And that excites me about the discussion that we were having whilst we were waiting to get in here with Mr. Owusu and said that how do we walk the talk? We talk too much and we do little. But the doers don't really talk. They just sit quietly and before you realize they are giving you evidence and results. And I feel that is, I don't want the government, must the government should the government this? No, the government cannot. The government is one entity and we are more than the government. And therefore the onus is on us, industry, academia, informal sector, private sector, whatever you want to call it, including my own big brand graphic. Our discussion is that after beyond this, how do we take your strategies and then set it up and come up with a practical intervention. We build their capacity, we set them up, we create opportunities, we monitor them, we guide them, we give leadership, we give direction. So that all those that retire, taking Mr. Sumeni's word, the retirees, the, you know, the public workers who feel that the salary is small, the unemployed adults, young and old, whatever, we will find ways to make the best of the resources that are wasting around us. The rainfall, the forest, and all the big things, the sunlight that the mighty God has given to us. How do we harness it to create wealth in our dear country? I wish you all the best. Thank you very, very much. Professor Olivia Kwapo, setting the tone for the conversation. You know, talking about why our students are not taking up other jobs while they're in school. Why is it that you walk to the library and not find students there, walking to the restaurants and not finding students there? Fantastic points. But I'm sure as we continue with the conversation, we probably would ask the question, how about availability? So while the students may be willing to work, are these jobs available? Because for many of us who have traveled outside and schooled, you found lots of students working in restaurants, you found students working in you know, mats and all of that. But are these jobs available in Ghana? Now, the good thing about industrialization and the good thing about a community exporting jobs is that there is always a boom in the services sector. Is it the same? with us. We'll find out because very soon we'll get to the causes and we'll get to dealing with the skill set and of course uh, crowning it all up with creating jobs uh, to create wealth in Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman for this occasion has built up a extensive experience in consumer goods over a career spanning nearly 30 years with Unilever working in supply chains and customer development roles across Ghana, Malawi, China, Singapore, Kenya, Nigeria after joining Unilever Ghana as a management trainee, that's very instructive, in 1990. Now, he has broad experience in planning, sourcing, and customer service excellence in supply chain, and his customer development experience include trade marketing for food, home, and personal care. With a round of applause, let's welcome George Owusu-Ansan, who is MD for Unilever Ghana, who is the chairman for today's occasion. And he shall now give us his opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. And first, let me start, uh, Winston, for, by thanking you for the very gracious and kind introduction. Um, Managing Director of the Graphic Communications Group, the Chairman of the Graphic Communications Group, the Chief Executive Officer of Stambik Bank Ghana, distinguished speakers and panelists, distinguished guests, 
friends from the media, I understand multimedia are here with us. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning once again and welcome very much indeed to this morning's program. The second quarter graphic business and Stambik breakfast meeting. And as already introduced, under the very appropriate theme, tackling unemployment to create wealth, opportunities for Ghana. I am very delighted to be here. I must confess that there was no chance I would have turned down the invitation and the opportunity to be part of this program. I indeed feel like a little boy at a party this morning. And it's simply because my purpose as a human being and pride as a Ghanaian, and I confess in all sincerity, I'm a very proud African and a very proud Ghanaian. It's always challenged when I travel on market visits as I do my job as the managing director of Unilever Ghana, because my job requires that I do extensive travel around our country and I always say with pride that I have seen every district in this country. And as I travel around our country doing my job, doing market visits, I'm always distressed when I observe so many of our people, both educated and uneducated, either unemployed or at best engaged in activities that barely sustain them. What is more worrying is many a time they are doing these activities, taking risks that are an affront to our collective civilization as a people. And so for me, it is not just a conversation about employment, but decent employment Employment that enhance our pride as Ghanaians. Employment that are not an affront to our civilization as a people. And how do we get there? COVID-19 and its effect on the health of the people of the world, global supply chains, cost of living, access to employment has brought renewed urgency to this problem. The need, therefore, to ignite the cycle of wealth creation and employment generation cannot be overemphasized. Our theme for today, distinguished guests, could not have been more appropriate. It is in many ways captured by sustainable Development goal number eight out of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which tell us that indeed decent work and economic growth are essential for peace and prosperity of any people. The planet now and into the future. In that respect, the theme for this morning is in very, very good company. Our country cannot be left behind in the quest to create decent and well-paying jobs that create wealth and create more jobs. And in the earlier discussions with Professor Kwapon, we were talking about not just creating jobs, but jobs that create wealth. Because what we have seen many a time, and our, the experience in our country is testimony to that, is you can create a job, you can give a job, but when the jobs do not create wealth and then create new wealth, the cycle breaks. So how do we make sure it becomes a cycle of wealth creating, job creating, wealth creating, job creating, and then it becomes a self-serving cycle. Most of our young people are ready to work hard. But as aptly put by the acclaimed author Idowu Konyinikan, and I quote, when you work on something 
that only has the capacity to make you $5, it does not matter how much harder you work. The most you would make is $5, end of quote. And this is something I would want us to reflect on as we talk about employment creation. Today's conversation, therefore, is about how we create an ecosystem that makes our country become a people who have the skills, the capacity, the attitudes, pride, and as Mr. Smeni mentioned, access and cap capability in dealing with technology and ICT. We have the infrastructure, and more importantly, the enabling environment, be it through trade policy, be it through our instructions at school, etc., that makes the Ghanaian and what we can do from here competitive versus the global value chain. Because the world has become one. We are a small country. We have a small population. The only way we can create jobs and compete in this global environment is to set ourselves up to be competitive globally. We, whatever comes out of here has to be competitive versus the global value chain. There are many things happening. For instance, we've started talking about after, very exciting. How do we set ourselves up to compete? Because it brings with it challenges of our small market becoming accessible to everybody else. And how do we enable ourselves to be competitive? And it is going to come from having a system that is competitive versus the value chain of the world. When we do this, then we would create space for our people, young and as reminded by Mr. Asmeni, the old as well. Whether they want to be entrepreneurs or whether they want to be employed. To all join in the pursuit of creating wealth first for themselves and for the nation. We have to perfect this and make the business of employment creation and wealth creation a cycle. This should become part of the identity of our nation. And I know many a time as Ghanaians we like to say, but do you believe this can happen in Ghana? The example of Singapore if we were looking for inspiration, is one to reflect on. And as mentioned in my introduction, I've had the luck to live and work in Singapore. And it is amazing when you read what that country was able to do in just a generation. And I strongly recommend for those who have not read it, to read the Singapore story from third world to first world by Lee Kuan Yew, the first Prime Minister of Singapore. And if you're looking for inspiration, if you're looking to believe that it is indeed possible in this country of ours, read that story. When you read that book, you will sometimes feel you are reading about Ghana today. And if you were looking for some of the things we could do to turn our beloved country around, you would find in that book. I'm assured by our national conversations, both in the past and in recent times, that our theme for today is a matter that we are united around as a country. I'm again assured by the manifestos of our political parties that our theme for today is a matter that they are united on. It's quite impressive on the back of the sometimes raucous acrimony in our political debates. All the parties recognize the need to create jobs as a national priority. I am more assured by the often look of desperation, demoralization, and anxiety on the faces of our young and, and old adults on the streets. When you look at our people on the streets, the desperation, demoralization, and sometimes anxiety you see on their faces. 
that our theme is their hope. The need, therefore, for today's theme cannot be overstretched. Our people need us to succeed in the business of employment and wealth creation for their well-being. We need this to become a great nation. As Franklin Roosevelt, one time president of America said, and I quote, no country, however rich, can afford the waste of its human resources. Demoralization caused by vast unemployment is our greatest extravagance. Morally, it is the greatest menace of our social order, end of quote. With this, I wish the speakers and the panelists great conversations. I wish all present stimulating, thought-provoking discussions. I look forward to, an inter to a very interactive dialogue and trust we shall together make ourselves the Graphic Communications Group and, Standard and Stambic Bank Limited proud by contributing to the noble enterprise of tackling unemployment to create wealth in our beloved Ghana. Our nation does indeed need this. We have to pursue this conversation though, using knowledge and science. And as Professor Quapon said, executing what we talk about. She did say that we talk too much. And so we've got to make sure that we execute what we talk about. And as we start the discussions, let the discussions and all of us be guided by what for me is my most famous quote. And it is from the renowned Scottish economist and philosopher, Adam Smith. And I quote, science is the antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. I will say, I would rephrase Adam Smith's quote and say, science, knowledge, and execution is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm, superstition, and sometimes the lack of belief and hope. I cannot end my remarks without expressing my sincere appreciation and gratitude to the board, management, and staff of the Graphic Communications Group Limited for the honor done me by inviting me to chair this morning's program. You have helped me live my purpose today. Thank you very much indeed. And with that, let's go. Thank you very, very much, George Oguswansa, who's the chairman for today's occasion. And so, I like the bit about inspiration, that if we're looking for inspiration, we can always look at Singapore. And I'm sure that's one thing we love to do in this country. So we have the inspiration already, because we'll look at Singapore, we'll look at South Korea, we'll look at Malaysia, and talk about how we started with them. And so now that we have that inspiration, it's time for us to get into the conversation, it's time for us to get into the discussion on how we can tackle unemployment, to create wealth, and the opportunities for Ghana. But before we do that, let me just remind you that as a question on your tables, please uh, you know, fill it. Uh, don't forget to do that. It's very, very important. We're also live on Facebook, on, so you can watch us on Daily Graphic Ghana page and Stambic Bank uh, Ghana pages. Time now for the panelists to join us so we start the conversation. First is Dr. Edu Ousu Sakodie, who is a lecturer at the Economics Department of the University of Ghana. Let's welcome with a round of applause. Please come up here for me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Edu Ousu Sakodie. Next is Florence Hope Wudu, who is Managing Consultant of Purple Almond Consulting Services. Let's welcome her with a round of applause. <laughs> Last but not least is Nana Osebunsu, President of the Private Enterprises Federation.
Great. So now that we have all the panelists seated, we'll start the conversation with the causes. One of the very important things we need to know is the causes of unemployment in Ghana. What are these causes? And Dr. Edu Ousu Sakodia starts the conversation. Dr. Sakodia, what are the causes of unemployment in this country? Why do we have 13.4% of unemployed people in Ghana, according to the Ghana Statistical Service? Why do we have almost 500,000 people being first time job seekers at the time where consistently we have talked about solving unemployment or creating jobs in this country. Uh, good morning, thank you for having me. Um, before we talk about the causes, let us define what we are talking about. What is unemployment? Now, unemployment as defined by ILO, which is International Labour Organization, is for a specific period where someone is 15 years or older, the person is without work, the person is available to work, and the person is actively seeking to work or seeking for opportunities. So who is not unemployed? You may be 15 years or older, but if you are not available to work, you are not unemployed. And if you are not actively seeking to work, you are not unemployed. And if you are working, but you want to look for another job, you are not unemployed. So this is the context within which we are having a discussion. And the types are the cyclical unemployment, where it is caused by economic slowdown, and we saw a typical example of this during COVID. Then the second type is the freshener, when we have our young men who have finished school and they're now first time job seekers, or somebody has left job, one job, and is looking for another job. Let me mention that unemployment is different from job, but for the purpose of this discussion, to make it much simple, we, we say job or work or employment. It should be the same. But maybe during a discussion, I will expand it. The structural one is when there's a mismatch of skills and the seasonal depends on the season. Now to the main, I'm not coming to answer your questions. <laughs> what are the causes? There are demand side factors and supply side factors to cause unemployment. The first one is when the economy is not expanding to accommodate those who are looking for a job. In other words, if the employment growth does not keep pace with the GDP growth rates. So let's take this room for example. This is the Ghanaian economy. Those of us here are the employed. Those outside are the unemployed. For those outside to get space in this auditorium, we must expand this auditorium. Maybe we have to break the walls and expand it or break the roof and some people will sit you know, up there. So when the economy is not expanding to accommodate those who are seeking job, it causes unemployment. And we have seen examples in Ghana where GDP was growing at 5.5%, but employment was growing at 3.3%. It, it means that unemployment was growing at 2.2%. There is something we call employment elasticity of GDP. In simple terms, if GDP grows by 1%, how much of it will it create employment in the country? And it is estimated, according to my own professor, head of department, Professor Bob Watson, I'm quoting him, that the employment elasticity of GDP in Ghana is between 0.4 and 0.6. In other words, for every one percentage growth in the economy, it can only create a job of 0.6% or 0.4%. So what has caused this slow growth, which is not expanding to accommodate? The labor absorptive sectors, agric and manufacturing, 
they are not expanding so much. Between 2017 and 2018, the extractive sector, which accounts for just 15% of the value of GDP, the extractive sector accounted for 46% of the GDP growth rate. When we rebased in 2018, we were told that the oil and gas alone accounted for 80% of the rebasing. So the extractive sector, which only employs, which only creates 0.8% employment, is the leading contributor of the GDP growth rate. The agri and the manufacturing that can create more jobs is not growing to keep pace with the extractive sector. There's also high interest rates, and I was having a discussion with you this morning about the interest rate. Time and time and again, we have seen the Bank of Ghana responding to increases in inflation rate by raising the policy rate. This causes the interest rate to rise giving the banks supernormal profits at the expense of our brothers and sisters who are working in the real sector to create wealth because interest rates is the cost of borrowing. So anytime you increase interest rates, it increases the cost of borrowing and the businesses cannot expand to create jobs. There's also a, a time where there will be an economic slowdown, recession, or financial crisis, as we saw in 2008 financial crisis, and also the COVID-19, as I've mentioned. So these are all factors that are causing the unemployment levels to rise in Ghana and across the world. The other factor is the large informal sector. We are training, I, my professor is here, so I'm comporting myself as a couple. We are training people for the former sector, yet the former sector is not expanding. It is rather the informal sector that is expanding. And that takes me to the supply side factors. And as I use this auditorium as an example, those outside are the, are the unemployed. So if the numbers keep increasing outside, then we will have more unemployed people on the outside. In other words, if the labor force is not increasing enough, you know, to keep pace with the employment growth, then there will be surplus labor, as we call it, and that is unemployment. The other cause is the low skill or the quality. If you needed accreditation to enter this auditorium, no matter the number of people outside, you must get the accreditation to be able to enter. So the accreditation is the skills. So no matter the availability of jobs, if you don't have the skills, to get it, you won't get it. And let me end by giving you some figures for those of us who love numbers. According to the population census last year, there are about 30.8 million Ghanaians. 11 million are below the age of 15, and they cannot, by the definition, they cannot work. 8.3 million are people above 15 years, but they are not working but they are not unemployed. They are just inactive. They could be in hospital, they could be in prison, they could be pensioners, or they could be people who have given up. And I think that majority of that are people who have given up because this number has doubled in four years from 2017 to 2021. There are people who are above 18 years, but they're not available, 15 years, but they're not available to work. That number has doubled from 4.3 million in 2017 to 8.3 million in 2021. And you have just 10 million Ghanaians working. That is about one third of the population working to feed themselves and the remaining two thirds. So the unemployment rate quoted at 13.5% is amounting to 1.6 million Ghanaians. And this 1.6 million if you like fo football very much, Accra Sports Stadium, let's assume it takes, uh, say, 40,000. So divided by 1.6, that's about 40 times. So the unemployed people can fill Accra Sports Stadium by 40 times. That's how big it is by the definition. These are the reasons why we have that high rate of unemployment in Ghana and across the world. Thank you very much. Uh, but let me just ask a few questions. I'll get back to you. You've talked about, you know, when 
I mean, part of the problem is when the economy is not expanding. Uh, you know, apart from 2020, where we know what COVID did to us, uh, from 2017 to 2019, the average growth rate, expansion in the Ghanaian economy, about 7%. Then you get to even 2021, post-COVID, or, well, we're still around COVID era, so we grew by some 5.4%. So clearly, you've seen some growth in the Ghanaian economy. Why is that not corresponding to curbing unemployment? The sectors that can create jobs are not expanding. The figure that you have quoted at 5.5% GDP growth rate is the total. Sure. And as an economist, I'm always interested in the details. So when I pick the report from the Ghana Statistical Service, I go deep down. The sectors that can create jobs, like manufacturing, is not expanding. Agric is not expanding because of the high cost of production. And so that is why you have that 5.5 um, post-COVID, but it's not creating, creating the jobs because the sectors that have high labor absorptive capacity is not expanding. We did a research. We took data in the Fourth Republic from 1993 to 2019. And we did a research to see how government capital expenditure, I know most of you know that, oh, the government should spend on infrastructure, government should spend on infrastructure to expand the economy. Uh, but so we tested it and realized that the finding was that infrastructure development or capital expenditure can create jobs if, the condition is if, there is macroeconomic stability. So in, in when we were modeling it, we took away macroeconomic stability, and it wasn't creating any jobs, even though government was spending. But when we put in macroeconomic stability, we realize that yes, that is the ingredient needed. What is macroeconomic stability? Low and stable inflation, low and stable interest rate, low and stable depreciation of the city, and low and stable public debt. As we speak, our inflation is 27.6%. The exchange rate has depreciated by 19%. Interest rate is around 25%. The public debt is close to 80%. The debt service as a ratio of revenue is 70%. These factors do not argue well for job creation, no matter your GDP. Inflation at 20 is this year. Last year, that wasn't the situation. Last year, last year, our interest rates were better than it was today. So, yes, we may be looking at this year, but a lot of the figures we are referring to are coming from the census of 2021. So, if last year, at the time we were supposed to be doing well by way of our macroeconomic indicators, we reported this, I just don't understand it. Help me understand. <laughs> Is it that something isn't working? Because all the things you've talked about, yes, this year it would look like this is the reason. But if we were to compare it to last year, we had good macroeconomic indicators. And it's one of the things that we trumpeted and said, even in the midst of COVID-19, we were still doing well as a country. Before COVID, our figures, most of the figures looked good, uh, most of them, but some of the key variables didn't look good. A typical example is a public debt. The debt service as a ratio of revenue. When we ranked 108 countries in the world, Ghana was only better than Sri Lanka and Lebanon. This is 2019 figure before COVID. So your macro environment, yes, I agree that inflation was as low as 7.9%, but Ghana's inflation of 7.9% was the fourth highest figure in West Africa before COVID. So even though our figures now look worse than before COVID, if you compare ourselves with our peers, we're still not looking too good at that time. And there is something we teach in, in, in our classroom like GDP is equal to C plus I plus X minus M. The I, which is investment, is the total investment. It is not only the public investment. So you need both the public investment and the private investment. So if the international community do not have confidence 
they don't think you can be able to service your debt. They raise so many questions about your economy. They are not likely to come into your economy to invest. And that is why we are not seeing that expansion. So back to your question, the figures now look worse than before, but I've already told you that key variables like the public debt, you know why we're so much in a hurry to pass the E-Levy, just to send a signal to the international community that yes, we can mobilize resources domestically to service our debt. Because they were not coming, they were pulling out. They were not demanding our sovereign bonds, even those who held our bonds were selling Ghana. So the macro environment is key to attract investment to create wealth. If there's any doubt, I'm afraid you're not going to get the results. And in effect, currently, there are doubts, and that's what we are seeing. I've already told you that in 2019, the debt service as a ratio of revenue, when we ranked 108 countries, Ghana was only better than two countries in the world, Sri Lanka and Lebanon. If you are an investor, will you bring your money to Ghana? That is only better than Sri Lanka and Lebanon, or you go to Ivory Coast. If there's any model that I want to study now, is the Ivorian model. Ivory Coast seems to be doing something very good. And I have started studying their model, what they are doing right, that Ghana is doing wrong. I must say that the entrepreneurs in this country have done very well. They have done their best to expand their businesses to create jobs. But it's not enough to change the structure of our economy. We have not, as a country, sat down to change the structure of our economy. We are just always scratching the surface. We don't go deep down there. That is why no matter how good your figures are now, it will not be sustainable. I'll get back to you, particularly when you talk about always scratching the surface, because one of the things I would want us to look at when I get back to you is the agricultural sector. Over the period, there's been a lot of investment in there. We've talked about how we had created some 745,000 jobs in 2017. We created hundreds, hundreds of thousands of jobs in 2018, 2019, all under planting for food and jobs. And so when we talk about the agricultural sector, you know, having to lead this, uh, one would expect that in the midst of all this investment, we would get somewhere. But let me get to you, Florence, because one other issue that has always come up when it comes to uh, you know, dealing with unemployment is the skill set. We've talked about whether the average job seeker is really prepared for the job or has the skills that would get him or her employed. Let's have your take on this. Let's look at the skill set. Let's look from an HR point of view. What's really the challenge with the job-seeking population of Ghana? And how can we solve it? Okay, good morning and thank you. Yeah, so um, if you look at the, um, the unemployment issues, a big thing for everybody, and it's, you've mentioned in the skill set. And I will take it from the point of view from, of mindset. Everybody who goes to school thinks that he has to come out of school and you know, work in a bank or get into a formal sector. But there's a big opportunity out there for the informal sector. Now, let's revisit the housing and population census report for 2021. You find that 60% of the data as published are self-employed who do not have workers working for them. And only 7% are pe employed persons who have employees. What does it mean for us? It means that everybody is thinking about himself. Everybody is thinking about one-man business. How do I survive? Now, I, I think that if you have to deal with a conversation on unemployment that goes beyond generations, then we need to open it up to look at how do we build successful employment for our generations beyond you yourself when you are no more, how does the business leave? And we'll connect to how the skills are coming to play. So you find that we come out of school, there are no jobs, all you find to do is you know, set up something for yourself. Now, it's a good data as a first point of call. How do we break the data down to get analysis of how much of these people are even in meaningful jobs? And the meaningful jobs will come with their skills. So, um, that's a conversation I want us to have at another time. Now, come back home to what you are asking, the skills. Um, I know there are a number of opportunities that you know, are being provided out there for us to build skills. 
because the people who come out of school may not get opportunities to readily get hands-on work to get into the employment. But the number of opportunities that donors are providing to build skills, if you go, go to the, um, I do a number of development supports, GIZ has a number of skills development programs, Ministry of Employment has a number of skills development programs, banks are rolling out training ship and internship programs for, 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 for individuals. But the conversation is how many of these are available and how much information is out there for people to take advantage of. So it comes back to having to create jobs out of this data that we have, 60%. That's a big data. All of them are doing one-man business. How do we grow for these people to fit in? That's something I want us to look at. Hmm. Now, those who come out of school, they may not have the skills, yet they don't want to take advantage of other areas that may not need high skills, like agri. Ghana is an agri-based economy. We don't have enough to feed ourselves. Otherwise, if we do, the Ministry for Food and Agri won't put a ban on exporting grain. The president of AU will not stop, will not go to Russia and Ukraine just to negotiate for the ban for um, greens to be lifted so that we can export green. Look at our arable lands. How much are we farming to feed ourselves? The, job, the skills are not matching, but how do we make use of what we have? Nobody wants to get into farming. And it surprises me. If we don't produce to feed ourselves, how do we get there? Okay. But talking about how do we get there, when you say the skills are not matching, let's break it down. What skills are in demand? What do we have currently? Why are they not matching? Well, the still cinema now, it's a lot of entrepreneurial skills. Hmm. I mean, there are no businesses. Everybody has to put on the entrepreneur hat. How do I become an entrepreneur? Beyond me, thinking about myself, how do I create the business for my brother to work? How do I create a business for my friend? So the big skill now should be entrepreneurial. In school, think of what business idea do I have? How do I formalize this business idea with the funding opportunities available? We've just said about Stambik talking to us about this incubation, SME support, national, um, um, national entrepreneurship and innovation program is available for funding. So how do I, first of all, develop my skills to take advantage of all these opportunities? Okay. It's the conversation of first mindset. Don't get out of school thinking that I will be readily employed because it's not there. Now we've seen it. How do I develop my skills to get into it? And that is what I want us to begin to think about. You know, as young graduates, what do I do to create employment for somebody? How do I grow my business beyond just me? How do I create, get the skill set that I need? What is going on there that I can take advantage of? Great. Um, so talking about skills development, now in 2011, I remember at the time we launched the Local Enterprise and Skills Development Program. Later on, we, lost, uh, we also launched the Youth Enterprise and Skills Development Program. So we've had the less step, we've had the yes step. Uh, around the time we you know, launched the Ghana Youth Employment and Entrepreneurial Development Agency. Fast forward that, we had the Youth Enterprise Support Scheme. Today we have the National Entrepreneurial and Innovation Program, all aimed at developing entrepreneurial skills. I don't know if you know, but what's been the impact of all these vehicles aimed at developing entrepreneurial skills in this country? Well, I think that now it's, it's, it's created a conversation around having to start up something. And now we, we have moved to the point of how do I support what has been started? So the funding has been a challenge. Now everybody wants to start something. The funding has been a challenge. And now the NEIP has come up with funding support. So not just, um, not just the skills, but if you identify it, now come home. Let's talk about it. Bring your business plan. How much can you, how, what is the business plan uh, trying to achieve? How much funding can we support you with? Then beyond that, I want them to even look at how can we monitor you to grow? So okay. monitoring the growth is what is more important. In fact, it's as much as important as having to get the funding so that these people can stretch and bring people in. 
Thank you, Florence. Um, but still, you know, talking about skills, let me just say that uh, we're joined by Ellen Hagan, who is CEO of Linné Services, and she would share a thought with us shortly, uh, briefly. But before that, let me get back to you, uh, you know, Dr. Edu Usisakwadia, because I had a, a question for you, because you talked about investment in agriculture. Over the period, we have invested a lot in agriculture. In fact, we talked about how uh, we're beginning to export food to neighboring countries. We're talking about how we're doing very well. Uh, we said we had cultivated some, you know, uh, 357 hectares, and if you needed two persons, uh, you know, to work on those hectares of land, you're looking at some 700,000 jobs just in 2017 only as part of, uh, you know, one uh, planting for food and jobs. So when you talk about investments in agriculture, we're investing in it, aren't we? And we're putting a lot of money in there. We're, uh, you know, giving uh, subsidized seedlings, uh, subsidized fertilizer. And this is expected to get a lot more people in there to create employment for those who need it, isn't it? What is the outcome? I'm always interested in the outcome. You have invested in this, you have done that. What is the outcome? The Planting for Food and Jobs program has run for five years. Today, Ghana seems to be, seems to be in food crisis. After a program has run for five years, that program was supposed to secure us food and jobs. The program is or was import dependent. Over 90%, I'm told, of all the fertilizer we use in the country are all imported. Now, how can you sustain your program for 10 years, 15 years, when it is import dependent. What was the strategy to produce fertilizer locally? I was in China. I was invited for a conference and we were studying their models. One of the things I learned in China was that their first economic model was that no Chinese should go hungry. No Chinese. Okay. No Ghanaian should, I'm coming, I'll answer your question. No Ghanaian should go hungry. That should be the position. I am not saying that the Planning for Food and Jobs program has not made any gains. I am saying that it is not enough. It depends on the numbers outside. You look at nominal figures and I will tell you that I am looking at the percentage, the ratios. Because if there are about 1 million people unemployed and you create 100,000, 100,000 is a number, but it's just 10%. So how many were unemployed before the program, and after the program, how many are employed and how many are still left behind? That is why I, I said earlier that the growth of employment must keep pace with the growth of GDP. So in this case, you have created 700,000, but how many are still left? I'm always interested in the ratio or the percentages. So. The agric must be emphasized, and I'll keep emphasizing it, that we shouldn't joke with it. And I think that is why Ivory Coast is doing better than us. I have started getting some figures from Ivory Coast that they have taken agric seriously. Our first point of contact, let's learn from the Chinese, is agric. Nobody should go hungry in Ghana. Enough of the slogans. I am borrowing the words from my professor. Enough of the talk. We are too much interested in slogans. The resource is not there to show. I am not blaming MPP. Even when NDC was in power, what did they show? So I don't want this to turn MPP and NDC because I'm saying this because the, the program is an MPP program. And I'm attacking both parties because they have been in office for all the years. We, enough of the slogans, we need a proper model, not an agri program that is import dependent, say that when there's Russia-Ukraine war, you can't have fertilizer, you can't have wheat, you can't have anything. That is not a sustainable program that can create jobs. 
Great. So at least, uh, now that there's Russia and Ukraine, it has taught us a lesson. That next time we think of any program, we must ensure that that program is not import dependent. Uh, I will take that. I'll take that. And that's a good point. So let's get to Ellen Hagan uh, to share her perspectives on uh, this discussion that we're having this morning. Let's welcome her with a round of applause. Please, you could be seated there, just uh, seated there and share your perspectives with us on this issue. Thank you and good morning um, to all of us. Um, I believe that um, um, unemployment is a global issue and we are here to look for solutions as to the way forward. And usually when problems seem so huge, we believe it's really difficult to, to get it done, to get anything done. But I'd like us to look at how we as individuals and as employers can change the status quo. And we in Lene, we have um, a program we call Bridge the Gap Between Academia and Industry. And what we do is that we provide internship opportunities for um, the people who are still in school so that during vacation they get to um, know about the world of work. And I say here that, you know, the, the people coming from school, they only get to, to, to develop their skills or get experience when they are on the job. And so when they are from school, usually they wouldn't have the skills that are required by um, industry. So, unfortunately, our, our, our young people coming out from school, where the bulk of the unemployment situation um, um, lie, they, they, they have a certain attitude towards life. And most employers don't want them in their workplaces because they will have their earphones in their ear, they'll be surfing. And so when we go looking for internship opportunities for them, nobody wants to take them because they will come and demotivate and spoil the culture of the organization. So we are advocating um, specific and intentional internship opportunities so that um, they'll be able to develop themselves and hit the job, hit the ground running when they come out of school. It's usually very difficult to get internship slots from our um, employers because of this regard. As parents, we have made lives too comfortable for our children. So they are no longer hungry and they are very choosy. And so the few, we have jobs in the system. I hasten to say that there are jobs. There just are not enough jobs to take care of all the people we are churning from school. So that um, gap, is, is, is that we, <laughs> the few that are available, when we get the young men and women to go and, and uh, interview for those jobs, they, 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 are, they, don't fit, they don't fit the bill, they have the, the, the wrong attitudes, they don't want to stretch themselves, they don't even want to go through the formal way, the conventional way of, of looking for jobs sending their CVs. The same CVs that they have, they will send it to every job opportunity. And when they attend interviews, they don't sell themselves well. And therefore, even the few jobs that are available, those who can work don't get the opportunity to work. So um, we are looking at a situation where, um, like the starfish story, we want people to, to do what they can do and in their small corner. If you can provide opportunity for somebody to, for you to mentor somebody, um, um, either as a, a job seeker or as a business owner, because I'm thinking that the mindset should start very early. 
that some of us can't create jobs for others. And parents all want their children to work in the um, blue-collar jobs, banks, and now it's um, the, the uh, what do you call it, the, the oil, isn't it? Yes. That's a sector that most parents want their children to work. The, you, you have an SME, or what most people call a one-man business company. No parents will want their children to go and work there. And that's also because they don't observe a lot of the small... Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, we are trying to lose weight, so that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, as I was saying, a lot of, a lot of um, such situations happen. So that, because they don't observe corporate governance, um, most people don't want to work there. They will not pay the right taxes, they will not pay the right salaries. So by the time they go to work, um, and, and from home, and from work, and um, the, the, the salaries they earn do not take them to work. So, uh, do not take them home, as they say. So, we, we, we have a situation where um, most companies don't want to um, um, cross that line. Okay. And so, we are going to encourage all of us that we should stop looking to the uh, government always for solutions. What the government can do for us is to um, encourage... Um, entrepreneurship at a very early age, a very early stage, and then help people to put systems in place in their various organizations so that they can um, grow and help people to, um, um, you know, become better citizens. You, you, you get me? Sure. So sure. We, we shouldn't always look to the government for solutions. Employers should do their bit. Individuals should do their bit. Parents should enc encourage their children that they can also work in small organizations and then they can also start their own businesses. And, and it's clear, there are some people who are doing that already, who okay. are um, um, starting their own businesses. Thank you very much. I had an opportunity again to sure. say something. Sure, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ellen. So let's get to Nanosei Bonsu. Um, and the focus should be on the opportunities for Ghana in tackling unemployment to create wealth. And Nana, you are the president of the Private Enterprises Federation. Tell us what opportunities exist for us as a country in tackling unemployment to create wealth. Good morning, everybody. And uh, Madam Chair, good morning. Professor uh, uh, Dr. Usan San, Chief of uh, Unilever, you and I met with the British ambassador and all discussing various avenues of employment and job opportunities and the uh, CEO of Stambik. Thank you very much for the invitation. My topic is avenues for jobs creation. I'm not going over the data. Prof went over the 13.9% of unemployment. Meaning, how did we cover that? How did we get that data? How do we know it's accurate? Who is reporting what? Do we have agencies that report that Abna and Kwesi came looking for jobs and they didn't find it? So we count one plus one plus two? So how do we have the 13.9? That's some a debate for another occasion. But avenues for job creation. What is the job market in Ghana? 100%? made up of public sector, made up of private sector, made up of civil society. Between public sector, which is 6.2 of the employment pool in Ghana, you have private sector formal, 6.8 of GDP. The informal sector is 86%. So if you're doing any analysis to create jobs, where are you going to look at? The informal sector. Encourage them, provide the resources, provide the competencies and capacities so they can create the jobs. 
Nobody sets up a business to create jobs. They set up a business to make money. And by making money, they need more hands, they expand, the economy will grow, and more people will be employed. So if you go by that philosophy, you design a policy that will allow this to happen. Encouragement by building the competencies and capacities of the human capital. No business is running automation with no human being organizing it. So that kind of monitoring to endow ourselves with the technical competencies and capacities to enable businesses to do the business, to enable businesses to create the jobs, is what we need to do. But who makes that decision? John Q. government. Do we know what capacities the government looks at before they do the policy? Let me take a day, an old investment policy of Ghana. They say, in Ghana, bring your business, come and do business as you want, make money and repatriate everything out. What happens to the locals? If we are going to export all the monies, repatriate all the profit margins, what doesn't happen? Hemorrhaging of our economy, capital, uh, capital flight, foreign exchange deficiency and, and you know, gyrations like spaghetti in the wind. We as a country have to have policies that encourage human development, number one, not only education. For the past one month, I've been looking for a driver. I get drivers who don't know how to drive. They know how to turn the steering, but they run over curbs. They run over runabouts. The guy see runabout, the left lane has right of way. He's going that way. Yesterday, I had an unfortunate experience of having one driver, and he didn't even know. He's driving an automatic. We get to the red light, we stop. He moved the gears to neutral. Then when it's time to go, he moves it to reverse. <laughs> this is our economy. <laughs> so the car is gonna go back. I yelled, he says, oh, I'm sorry. We could have had an accident. This is the economy that should be moving forward. But if you're depriving the economy of the resources needed to move it forward, how do you do that? The resource mobilization, the capital flight. I've written to Bank of Ghana since April, looking for them to give us the data as to how much money has been repatriated from Ghana in foreign exchange for the past five years. I haven't received a response. I went to the status department, I haven't received a response. If we don't know how much capital is leaving our shores, and we don't know capital mobilization, and we go on out every time borrowing, now the government borrows so much, and the government has to pay back, where did we put the investment from the borrowings? Did we get returns enough to allow the private sector to tap into that resource to enable them to create the job opportunities. The government now has to pay back those loans at eight to one exchange rate, and they borrowed at four to one. So the government itself is gonna suffer, and that's why the government doesn't have resources. But looking at avenues, so the private sector is the engine, we say, of growth. The engine without petrol, without diesel, without all the ingredients that are necessary, the MD of Stambik touted what they're doing to push entrepreneurship, to put up uh, human development, but that's one institution. What about all of us? And my fair lady was just talking about parents wouldn't allow their children to go and work for one-man shop. Why not? Entrepreneurship, that's where they learn. That's how they get the experience. So looking at the private sector, the 86% of the informal sector on the side, the 6.2% of private sector, 46% of that 62 is in agriculture. 
That is our bread and butter. In agriculture, we have two categories, the man-made and the God-made. The natural agriculture that goes to rot in the bushes, the waste, mangoes, papaya, oranges, and all, nobody collects them. We have a LEAP program. The LEAP, we pay people who are vulnerable to be able to survive. Can we incentivize them to go into the bushes to collect these things, bring them for value addition, and create the opportunity? These are things that practical experience, practical exposure, practical actions. Those are the things that we need to do. Then the policy angle, I come back to it. Can we say that, okay, if you're going to repatriate the profits home, leave a percentage in Ghana for maybe three years or five years and all. It's still your money, but we won't let you transfer all of them out at a goal. On top of that, we also need the private sector to be the risk. No private sector, sane private sector business will take a risk, inherit uh, in an endeavor and go and invest there. Now we have Gessel. It erases the exposure in agriculture some, but they only de-risk the banking system, the financial institution who grants the loans. They do not de-risk the farmer. The farmer who started the point A, who now goes to the bank and says, I need resources to enable me to do my business. The bank says, okay, we give it to you. Guess what is going to de-risk Mr. Asmeni, but it's not going to de-risk Mr. Uswansa because he's a private sector, because he's not organized. But he's the one who started the ball rolling. So the risking opportunities is what we call incentivizing affirmative action. You incentivize the private sector to go to areas they normally wouldn't have done and then provide the, risk, the risking of what the exposure is. So if you need to create jobs, you need to create jobs in areas where they would, as Madame indicated, keep rolling. There's not a, you know, a standard where they cut the brakes. It got to continue. Uh, Mr. Osanson indicated. So to me, the avenues are the vehicles, the ways, the uh, pathways to enable private sector, which creates the jobs, to enable them to do and continue to do so they will be magnifying in the South. But you also need the resources, the financial resources. No business is going to survive without financial resources. Now that we have inflation going sky high, cost of money is high, cost of doing business is high, and then what? The taxes. Taxes. We have one shoe fits all, 25% for all profit margins. Why? You have micro, small, and medium enterprises. 25% of 2,000 is more impactful than 25% of 2 million. So why don't we create a target tax system, a tier tax system, allow the small potatoes to pay a minimum so they can generate enough internal revenue, internally generated funding to feed their business. Their first allegiance is their business. That's why they established it. So if you push them to the edge like internal revenue or government revenue services doing, that if you don't pay, we put you in jail. If you put the people in jail, there goes their business. There goes the income that they pay into taxes and they collapse with government revenue. So we should be partners, encouraging the private sector, look, you have to pay your taxes. They say, well, I don't understand it. And we did a research that shows 46% of our private sector with education level not higher than high school. They don't understand the tax system. So instead of encouraging them, you actually antagonizing them. And they say, catch me if you can. And you're gonna cost more money to catch them to pay the peanuts. Nobody in their right mind will pay a consultant to pay taxes. So it's the responsibility of government avenues, government revenue services, to make sure that they encourage and partner the private sector to pay the taxes. 
Government tax is what? 13.9% of GDP versus 18, 20% in our neighborhood. Why are we not paying taxes? The private sector, they don't want to pay taxes. The guy says, I don't understand your language. Teach him the language, let him and work with him to pay the taxes. So I'm looking at avenues, the taxes, the policies of keeping a percentage of our profit margins in country. Have we noticed that every time there's a CD gyration, it occurs between October and March? Because that's when everybody is repatriating their profits home to pay their uh, subscribers, to pay their shareholders. So, sir, the avenues for jobs creation is the same avenues once you create the jobs and multiply yourself to become a wealth creation. And that wealth creation is what we need in Ghana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. So you've talked about agriculture. You've talked about you know, the fact that we should check a bit over the structure of the economy. Let's look at the avenues in agriculture, for instance, briefly, just about a minute, and then we'll get to our audience, who would be uh, also, whether you have any questions for you, and then uh, some contributions also. Tell us what avenues there are. You know, agriculture, we have all the raw materials that we need. All we need to do is value addition. And the value addition, we need one element that makes it profitable. That, electricity. And Ghana government oversubscribed electricity at high pricing, the PPA agreements. So the private sector said, wait a minute, we can't afford to buy that energy. So allow us to set up our own energy angles with solar. God has blessed us with that. 24, uh, I mean, half of the day we have solar. We can add waste management to convert uh, to energy. This way, we have cheap source of energy. In our environment, in West Africa, we pay in Ghana, we pay in about 27 cents per kilowatt hour. In certain jurisdictions, they're paying two cents per kilowatt hour. How do we compete under the face of the continental free trade? Our products that are going to the market are going to be unprofitable, cannot compete. The agriculture angle is abundance of raw material, add value, create the smallholder farmer. He does the farming in a nucleus outgrower arrangement, bring him a lot more capital and resources, technical infrastructure and others, and then move him to the next scale. Instead of being a farmer alone, now he becomes an entrepreneur. He's part of the value addition business. The next time he's going into the market. So these are things that we can do and we know what to do. So if we do agriculture, 46% of our population are involved in agriculture. So we need that. Thank you very much, uh, Nana. Let's give a round of applause. So it's your turn now. If you have any question or contribution, uh, just show by hand. We'll get a microphone to you. You tell us your name and where you're coming from, and then you go ahead to ask the question. So we have a hand here. Yes, then it will come to you. Yes, please go ahead with your question or contribution. Thank you very much. My name is Eric Amponsa. I'm a tax consultant. Now, okay. um, when it comes to unemployment, we must know that technological advancement can create unemployment. Okay, and we have seen that in the country. Now, GRA, for example, has a payment platform. And so immediately, if you used to send somebody to the GRA to go and pay your taxes, you don't need to. You can file your returns, make payment online. So immediately, you may have to probably dispense with the services of some of your employees. Now, we are also looking at the fact that the private sector is the engine of growth. But we must know, like um, my friend mentioned, government must put in place policies or measures that will enable businesses to tr thrive. And what are we saying? You look at our tax laws. Yes, we have some in the location um, incentives, tax exemptions, holidays. But 
The taxes in themselves, if they're not managed properly, can lead to the, the collapse of your business. And I know about two or three of my clients that have shut down because of taxes. Now, we are also talking about the fact that you need to probably set up your own business. We have just learned that the youth who come out of school, most of them now want to set up their own businesses. But look, it is not easy. How to even get the seed capital to start a business? If you want to start, fuel cost, utility, the data. So all these do not promote people who even want to set up their own businesses. Another issue which is very important in Ghana is that when you employ people as a private person, the employees, majority of them, when they come in, they think that it's an opportunity for them to steal. Okay, they, they are not thinking about the fact that they need to work very hard so that they can even expand your business, pay them well, and employ new um, ones. Finally, I have uh, so, so much here, but let me just mention. We are looking at, for example, the free zones. I wrote an article on the free zones. We abuse it. What happens is that those people set up those companies in the free zones uh, enclave. And when you do that, you bring in your machines, equipment, you don't pay any, uh, any taxes. When it is getting to the 10 years, what do they do? They fold up, go and register new businesses. Thank God now they cannot do that because of the tax identification number or the Ghana card. But I think that all in all, government is doing well. I think the effort that the government is putting in is good and we must all make sure that we support what the government is doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's get to the other table. Yes. And then we'll come here. Thank you very much. My name is Stephen Naseb Wedi. I'm a digital marketing and communication consultant. And uh, there are a couple of things I want to raise, if you don't mind. First is that I'm glad my friend who just finished speaking mentioned it. The future of work is digital. We need to embrace that. There's an example I often give. If you're a driver today and you don't know how to use Google Maps in Accra, very soon you're going to find yourself made redundant because you need that skill to be able to navigate the traffic in Accra. And that's how we need to embrace technology in this part of the world. Uh, the second one to say is that work from home is real. This craze about bringing everybody back to the office, we need to abandon it. Just yesterday, we heard that on the Tamamoto, we people spent three hours to get to office in Accra. We need to start allowing people to work from home, and we should enable that. And that's a conversation I wish you could have. Uh, I've also got right pay for work done. This is a bit controversial, but let me say it. There are so many people who go to work and put in only two hours, and yet they are paid nine to five. We need to get to a point where people are paid wages per hour. So, for example, excuse me to pick on my camera photographer here. If we need him on an assignment for only two hours, he should be allowed to go and work for a blogger, for example, to make extra money and pay her appropriate salary or wages for the two hours that we need her. We shouldn't employ people nine to five just because that's what we're used to. Uh, and the new jobs also that we need to encourage. Farmer is like a new job now. So many young people are calling themselves farmers. And we need to encourage more people to embrace these kind of jobs. YouTuber, some people call themselves TikToker or whatever. These are new jobs that the new era is creating for people. And we need to encourage more people to get into it. We shouldn't see jobs as just tire-wearing nine-to-five jobs that we go to daily. Uh, finally, I just, I'm just happy that we didn't have anybody from government on the panel today. We should start having honest conversation about jobs without blaming government and start thinking about how government can only enable private sector to create more jobs and not be the biggest employer in the town. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, let's get to you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Edward Carraway. I work with the General Agricultural Workers Senior, and I'm so excited to be part of this program. I'm also excited because the topic is talking about employment, and then the reverse of it is unemployment. It's not talking about jobs. The professor indicated that 
we use these words interchangeably. That is job and employment. But for us, in labor, we are looking at employment and not jobs. So I'm happy that the topic is not about jobs, but it's about what? Employment. Um, it's, it's difficult to hit a snake without hitting the ground. We are here talking about employment. We can't talk about employment without talking about government policy. Because government, we are all directed by policy. Policy influences everything. We are where we are today because of what we did yesterday and what we did not do many years back. If we have to move forward, we have to have a sincere discussion about what we did and we are now in the mess today that we are talking about so that we can correct ourselves moving forward. I just want to, because we go to the field, and my work as an agri worker senior, I travel all around the world, I mean the country, to see things for myself. The future is bleak for agriculture and for employment. Why? We are talking about employment that is decent. Employment that you can create wealth out of it. It is not employment that you take wages for just today and you cannot save for tomorrow. We are not talking about wages or employment that does not guarantee a future. You don't pay social security. And let me put this, if you take plantation agriculture, in the next 10 years, 20 years, some of the plantations that are existing in Ghana today will no more be there. Why am I saying so? The rubber plantations, the palm oil plantations, today, Galamsi is pitching camp in the plantations. How can Galamsi and trees coexist? We are all aware that cocoa trees are being cut down for what? Uh, Galamsi. Secondly, if you look at the mining sector, two years back, Goldfields decided to declare all their workers redundant and employ them the following day on fixed employment, on fixed terms, about two years. These people who have been employed on fixed terms now have employment worse than before. So their current employment cannot be creating wealth. Newmont, Ghana is at the verge of doing the same. Okay. And then you look at Vodafone. And I'm saying this thing because in 2008, when we sold out uh, Ghana Telecom, we had over 2,000 workers there today. In 2010, only 1,000 workers were left. Today, only 200, about 200 are permanent. The rest are just on casual, on contract. As you wrap up. So my point here is that, and then if you look at our agriculture today, we are de-investing in agriculture. We lost a great opportunity with the planting for food and jobs. Two objectives, food and jobs. If you ask us today, and we might say, where is the food? If you ask us, where are the jobs that it was supposed to create? Okay. So this is the future that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edward Carway. I'll get Nana to just respond briefly, and I'll get back to you. We have just 15 minutes to go or less. I think we have 13 minutes to go. Yes, Nana. Uh, briefly come in before we move to the next batch of questions. Thank, thank you. Uh, food sustainability through the value chain, have we developed that? Investing in agriculture is a continuous process. You don't end one day. You have to continue to evolve. But I like the gentleman, I think he's gone, talk about free zone. In Ghana, when we establish policy, it's not easy sometimes to reverse it and make sure that is it valuable, is it working, are we monitoring, getting the results? Are we getting the results intended when we establish the free zone? 
when they export under the free zone, they're supposed to export 80% of what they produce locally using local raw materials. Are we doing it? Who is monitoring? Do we get the returns do, or they keep them in the overseas bank accounts? Is free zone relevant as of today when you have the international, intercontinental Africa trade? Where they're not paying tariffs elsewhere? Where the tariffs coming in are going to be forgiven because of the IATF? So these are issues of policy that I mentioned, investment policy, allow everybody from the globe to come and invest and repatriate 100% home. So we as a people should be looking to interrogate and engage government as to yes to yes policy, are they working to create the jobs, to create the income. Agriculture in Africa is going to be one trillion in nine years. We only own 20%. Who owns the rest, the rest of the world? You think they're going to give it to us on a silver platter? No. So we have to make sure that we engage our government, the locals, the local businesses are encouraged and supported. We proposing 40% of all capital, all expenditure of government should be invested in the local businesses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nana. Um, let's get to the next batch of questions. Okay, I saw. Let's hand up earlier. Let's come here. Okay. Thank you very much. I come from the Chartered Institute of <coughs> Human Resource, Ghana. Excuse me. My question goes to Dr. Sarkodie and the insightful presentation by Prof. Kwapon. The Policy reconciliation aspect is what I'm looking at in terms of employment sector as against the educational sector. What data do our universities or our institutions of learning have with regard to what areas of prospects are available, such a way that you can supply to fit in? It appears that we are oversupplying from the institutions of learning, what informs our institutions of learning, the courses you render, the okay. number of applications that you open up, and then the students who apply in, and then they come out, and then the demand is very, very limited. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Dr. Sarkozy, if you could kindly answer that. Okay, thank you. Um, the institution, education institutions are there, first of all, to train the mindset of the students. And that is the first objective. So it's possible that we can just do a wholesale education and then the person goes out there to apply what he or she has been taught. Um, a classmate of mine now has shoe factory in Ghana, but he wasn't taught shoe production in the classroom. So the first thing is just get the mind trained. And secondly, I agree that the skills that we channel out is important. And most often than not, I usually talk to my colleague lecturers that we should start this engagement between the academia and those in the industry in different strategies. First one that I propose is the commercialization of the dissertation or the thesis where we can allow the students to be sponsored by Stanbeg or Unilever to write their own dissertation using data from Unilever, for example. Or after the student has written the dissertation, can now sell it to Unilever for their own policy formulation. So the commercialization of the dissertation or the thesis is important. Now, the statistician released the inflation figures the food inflation in Upper West is the highest in the country. However, their neighbors, Upper East, has the lowest food inflation. What is happening? So as an economic student, you go to the northern part to study what is happening there. That's how come you can bridge the gap between academia and the industry. Prof talked about intention, which I want to emphasize. 
if you have the students that can have internship, and I use myself as an example. When I was writing my thesis, uh, PhD thesis, I had the opportunity to be at UN Wider and also at IFS, and I was taught how to read the fiscal table. I had a master's degree. I didn't know how to read the fiscal table, but I learned it during my internship. And the fiscal table is a real world situation. The lecturers may be too busy to teach fiscal table, but through the internship, based on the work that we do, I learned how to read the fiscal table from the Ghana Fiscal Service. So the internship is important. And then another strategy that the universities now encourage us to use is to allow the industry players to come as visiting scholars to teach the university students. And I think the next semester I'm going to do that to invite somebody. To um, what strategies we we want something to take away? What strategies are we going to to um, re, you know implement, recommend for implementation? The action points so that we leave here with a few things. I I I, I think you can tease that out, sure. and then we make. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ellen Hagen. Um, unfortunately, uh, we're just some five minutes away. And so we'd invite the chairman for his closing remarks. And we welcome him with a round of applause. Good morning again. And uh, first, let me thank our panelists. Um, Nana, it's always a pleasure to meet you. And uh, thanks for the energy you bring to the discussions around how we get things moving in this country. And Florence, good to meet you. Thanks for the perspectives. And uh, Doc, thank you very much for the insightful review of our situation as a nation in the matter of employment and employment generation. And for those who have contributed and for all present, thank you very much indeed. I think we've had a very, very good discussion. And before I continue my remarks, I would like to again thank um, Professor Quapon and Mr. Asmani for your organizations working together to bring us here to have this discussion. I am living enlightened, and I believe many people live here very enlightened. We've heard from Dr. Sarkodie that even though we are growing, GDP is growing, the labor absorptive sectors of our economy are not growing. And he mentioned agriculture and manufacturing. He said, we are training people to the formal sector whilst it's the informal sector that is growing a mismatch of where we are putting our money in terms of capability building to where the opportunities are. Then we heard from Florence about needing a mind shift change because people come from the universities and they want to work for the Unilever's and the Stambics. So how do we match scales to where the opportunities are? And then Nana talked to us about an env um, enabling environment that would support growth of uh, job creation, growth, and wealth creation. So at the end, it leaves us in a very interesting but hopeful place. We do not have enough jobs. Where we have the jobs, we sometimes do not have the skills. And I say this, it, I have found it amazing when you reflect on what we've heard today, that in Ghana today, we have people coming out of Ghana, out from outside Ghana to be mates in Ghana. We have all manner of people in Ghana today laying bricks, doing carpentry work, 
non ghanaians and our countrymen and women, the youth and adults, as reminded by Mr. Semeni, are on the streets without jobs. That is something for us to reflect on as a people. So what do we do? And I think a question was posed when we leave here, what do we do? Before I give my thoughts on that, let me go on to say that first is a lot of things at the national level, a lot of things have to come together to take us out of this quagmire. One is the need to build capabilities to face where the opportunities are and making sure that as a country, we are very clear where we want, we think we have the advantage to create wealth, where we think we have the advantage to compete versus the global value chain. And I'm going to give an example that I find, uh, many people find very controversial. But mentioned earlier, I lived for four years in Singapore. Singapore does not have land. It is actually an island nation. Every, almost every food eaten in Singapore is imported because Singapore does not farm. Indeed, the water we drink in Singapore, I think 50% of it was being imported from Malaysia at the time. And then the rest was through collecting rainwater. It had 17 dams at the time where all rainwater was harvested and reprocessed, and then a bit of desalination. And what Singapore focused on was basically running a system because they recognized we don't have land. We don't have water, uh, but we have human beings. And how do we determine for ourselves where we want to what we want to train our people to be? And Singapore said, we're going to train our people to be, to one, be very capable. And because we don't have land, we don't have natural resources, they have to create wealth in the high end of manufacturing and enterprise. So when I was in Singapore, when Ghana was looking for oil, the vessel that was going to look for the oil, Singapore made it. I was there when the late Professor Mills and the team came to get it. Most of the high-end um, products for medicine are made in Singapore, a very small nation of more than five million people. The simple message is, as a country, we've got to define for ourselves where we think we have the advantage. We still export cocoa in crude form. It goes somewhere and people make the chocolate and the gentleman talked about agriculture dying. It is dying because we are not adding value. If you don't add value to what you produce and you spend your time engaged in producing commodities, then you are at the mercy of the larger world. And how do we, after so many years of producing cocoa, add value? We are the, one of the greatest producers. We are endowed with a lot of extractive minerals, but we still export much of that in crude form. Why are we not, I understand a place like India doesn't, make too, doesn't produce too much um, gold, but most of the world's gold is processed in India. It, isn't that interesting? So how do we understand <laughs>